I'm John Batchelor. Larry Kudlow of Kudlow Reports, CNBC, and Kudlow Radio on the weekend joins me. Larry's got a piece up going in the Wall Street Journal that looks to rosy days behind and rosy days ahead. It's called Cut Taxes. Larry, let's have a fun time with this. Once upon a time, a president of the United States believed in cutting taxes for growth. Uh, you have one choice, Larry, and it's not Ronald Reagan. Who was that? Well, the first tax cutter was a Democrat, and his name was John F. Kennedy. And it's an amusing uh, political idea because, first of all, the Kennedy family today is very, very liberal and left. Second of all, the Democratic Party under Barack Obama is very liberal left. They would never do it. I mean, Kennedy lowered taxes on rich people. He lowered tax rates on middle-class people. He cut tax rates on business and created a tremendous boom after the 1950s, which had three recessions, the Kennedy tax cuts created one of the greatest booms of all time. And the, the irony today is that the current Democratic Party, with Obama proposing a trillion-dollar tax hike in his budget release today, the Democratic Party has just moved a long ways away from John F. Kennedy. Uh, Larry's piece up right now at the Journal Cider will be overnight, and there's a book coming, and we'll speak more of this in the program. We want to welcome our first guest, Brett Ahrens of the Wall Street Journal and Market Watch. Brett, very savvily writing, not just about the American economy, but about the world economy, watching the events in Ukraine. Brett, uh, it's 48 hours since you published your first How to Play Ukraine piece for uh, Market Watch in the Wall Street Journal. How are you doing, Brett? Good evening to you. I'm uh, Good evening to you, too. I'm, I'm doing very well, and uh, nice to be back with my old friend, uh, Larry. Um, yeah, it's been a very interesting, uh, interesting time, obviously, since the weekend, and uh, Putin's move into the Ukraine. I've actually written a couple of pieces on this, and they probably one that came up went out today uh, over on Quartz is actually maybe of more interest to your your listeners. Uh, I have made a uh, an argument that actually the this is a time for the bold to be buying small cap Russian stocks, <laughs> which sounds like a highly extreme move, but I would argue actually is quite the reverse. They are incredibly cheap. They are in effectively what is the 80% club. They're down about 80% from their peak, which was in 2007, and nobody else will touch them with a barge pole. Uh, this is possibly the cheapest asset anywhere in the world. Uh, obviously, it is uh, risky. All investments are risky. But uh, if people are looking for a, an interesting contrarian wager in this environment, that would be the one to take. Well, Brent, uh, by the way, good to, good to hear from you. Um, I, you. You may be right. Gosh, I don't know a thing about small cap Russian stocks. <laughs> the, only, the only question, so I have no reason to doubt you. The only question I'd ask you, though, is if if Putin takes this thing, uh, further and further. I don't know what he's going to do in, in Crimea. That's still an open-ended issue. Obama is talking very, very tough, uh, of which I approve, I might add, and then Putin is talking tough back. What's the risk of the Russian ruble, which has been slammed during this um, crisis, just collapsing like it did back in 1998? Well, yes. Well, this is one reason, actually, why I would not uh, be speculating on rubles or Russian government bonds, uh, which are nominal assets. But stocks, of course, are real assets, which is that essentially um, if, the, if the currency collapses, uh, sooner or later that just filters through into higher valuations on stocks. Uh, they're real rather than, than nominal. The argument for Russian stocks, I mean, I'm being slightly whimsical. I mean, I'm serious about it as an investment case, but it is definitely a, a bet. Um, the argument is that these things have fallen so far that essentially the risks are already priced in. Um, you are dealing with a situation where essentially everyone has stampeded out. Um, you know, I actually, I would be surprised. You do to some extent have to try and any investment involves some degree of betting on the future. Um, one tries to avoid making too many predictions because predictions, as Casey Stengel uh, once pointed out, are, are uh, usually wrong. But... Um, you know, I don't know how, how far this is going to escalate. Crimea is, as far as I understand, largely Russian and used to be Russian up to about 50 years ago. And Putin is returning that. And, you know, first of all, I don't see the West going to war over this. Second of all, you know, the, the idea of sanctions, I mean, the fact is Russia's main exports are oil and gas. 
and they will find a ready uh, ready buyer for their oil and gas. In fact, I noticed that one, one effect of the crisis is that the oil price went up. So, um, you know, theoretically, Russian uh, oil and gas producers can make more money uh, as a result of this crisis. Um, you know, and unless Putin goes crazy and starts trying to sort of, you know, take over the whole of the Ukraine or invade Poland or something, and I see no particular reason to, to, to think that that's likely, then, you know, I would be very surprised. Uh, I mean, it may go much further, but I would be surprised. What about gold, Brad? What's that? Gold. Gold. What are, what are, now, one of the things um, that I mentioned in, a, in a, an article I wrote over the weekend, it was a more, wasn't written for people who are speculating about um, speculating in small cap Russian stocks, but for the average person. And I said, one of the things that came out of this is that we have been hearing for the last year or so that gold is a sort of a ridiculous investment. And everyone is either hugely bullish of gold or hugely bearish of gold. And it it, it, it brings out enormously strong sort of emotions. People debate it, they get very angry about it. And I pointed out at the weekend, I said, look, actually this invasion is a, is a very good reason to say that gold is not a silly investment. I don't know what an ounce of gold should be worth. I don't know how much gold one would want to have in a portfolio. But it's not silly. And the reason it's not silly is because we may be entering an era um, the the first era, really, in a hundred years, when one you know one power, when there isn't basically a fixed um, sort of global order, and one power, the United States, can't really dictate things. You know, we our share of the global economy is declining. Our national power, relative to others, particularly China. Um, is declining. That is a natural order of things in the sense that China's got many more people than we have, and as long as their economy grows, sooner or later it will overtake ours. When that happens, you tend to have eras of conflict, and uh, this is a perfect example. Putin would not, have, you know, Yeltsin would not have dreamed of doing this in 1995, but the world has changed a lot. And in a situation like that, you may find that gold has safe haven. Um, uh, sort of aspects to it. I'm not a huge gold bull, but it's not silly. It is perfectly possible to say, look, Putin has been stockpiling gold. China has been stockpiling gold. They can both, both of those countries can clearly see um, a possible future where the dollar is not, you know, the the corner cornerstone of reserves. And obviously, you know, they like to include gold in, the, in their own reserves. Um, for, for you know, they can always find a buyer for it. They can always use, if you're being isolated, you can always use you know gold to buy things. Larry, the market snapped back big time today. Does that mean the crisis is over as far as the street's concerned here? Well, I don't think so. I mean, the, I, I, my sense is, and I could be wrong here, but I think the market on Monday was very worried that uh, Putin would march his right. um, army into eastern Ukraine. I don't think it's um, Crimea per se. I think it was the idea that we'd have a full-scale you know, civil war in Ukraine, and that that's not an American event. Ukraine is a tiny economy, and for that matter, so is Russia, uh, at, even with the oil and gas. But outside the oil and gas, Russia has almost nothing. But I think people instinctively uh, you know, hit the sell button because what might spread to Europe and might cause uh, prices, uh, oil and gas prices to go up, things of that sort. And today they breathed a sigh of relief when Putin backed down and, and sent the Russian troops back to the barracks um, and the, rather than into the Ukraine. Now, again, uh, the Crimea is, is a tricky issue. I honestly don't know. I asked a couple of diplomats tonight what would happen to the Crimea, and I, I don't know, but it, it looks to me, just from some news reports uh, this evening, that Obama may not go to the G8 meeting and is quite serious and believes that Russia has no business running um, the, uh, Crimea. They have no business. They're invading a sovereign state with its own legislature and its own prime minister, uh, which does uh, is part of Kiev and the Ukraine uh, country. And that I think we won't stand for that. And if Obama holds that line, I will be very proud of him, actually. In fact, I think Obama, and the truth, and I'm a critic of Obama um, um, almost every day, including his foreign policy, but nonetheless, I think he's acted rather well and strong during this whole period. So I don't know what's going to happen. L Larry Kudlow of Kudlow Reports. Brett, a return on investment for Market Watch. your last word. These are early days, or is the anxiety over, Brett? 
Oh, I mean, look, I think this is going to rumble on, but I don't see... I would be surprised if there is a very sharp escalation. That doesn't mean it can't happen, but I right. would be surprised. Brad Ahrens of The Wall Street Journal and Market Watch. He writes ROI, Return on Investment. I'm John Batchelor.